I'm Wang Liu from North Korea University. I'm delighted to introduce the second speaker. He's very well known and his name is Professor J.S. Chen. He was previously a Chancellor Professor and Department Chair of Civil and Environmental Engineering in UCLA. He was recently moved to University of California, San Diego as the William Parker Professor of Structural Engineering and also the Director of Center for Extreme Event Research. His research interests are in computational sound mechanics and multi-scale material modeling. He particularly emphasized on measuring methods. In my opinion, he is one of the best measuring researchers in the United States, if not in uh, the world. Uh, he is the past president of the USACM. He has received several awards, including the IACM Computational Mechanics Award. Let's welcome Professor J.H. Thank you, Lee, for your kind introduction. Um, I would like to first thank the organizers for organizing such an exciting conference, and I appreciate the opportunity to participate in this event. But what I'd like to talk to you today uh, is uh, sharp modeling using H3 method. And my particular interest is in the application of uh, learning and solids. And uh, this is the uh, work in collaboration with the US Army Engineering Research, Engineering Research and Development Center. Okay, uh, well, in a lot of uh, commercial and, uh, and defense applications, impulse loads exist and it causes uh, shock. So for examples are explosive cutting and weldings. Laser weldings typically generate thermal shocks, for example. The mining and earth uh, cratering uh, processes and the collision of vehicles and aircrafts and penetration of blast events, these are the typical problems that we are interested in. And these problems typically high strength rates high-strength gradients, large information, production damage, are the consequence of strong uh, hydrodynamics effects, and that those leads to sharp uh, formation. Well, as you know, when sharp forms, uh, many state and, and field variables propagate uh, in space in the form of discontinuities, and that introduces uh, uh, numerical difficulties uh, the key physics are standard ones. Uh, these are the handle and draw jump conditions, the second law of thermodynamics, and really that what it says is that the entropy cannot increase, and entropy has to increase uh, when you have an adiabatic uh, reversible process. And that condition is important. That condition determines where there will be sharp forming or there will be a, a rare, rare fraction. And then the, the Hugonian thermodynamic response. Well, what are the considerations of shock modeling? And typically, uh, this is quite difficult in four mechanics. The first thing is to make sure that the shock physics are, are properly uh, represented in a numerical simulation, in a numerical formulation. And a standard way of doing that is to get a real one solution, just to make sure that the action is correct and representing the correct uh, shock equations. Now, uh, in terms of the discontinuities in the solution, that typically leads to the Gibbs phenomenon. And this goes all the way back to the Gardner theory, which says that, uh, that the monotonicity preserves Gibbs more happily for solar. And uh, you know, many limiters have been proposed basically based on this uh, uh, total variation um, you know, uh, mutations and the Eno Uno schemes. Uh, these gives you the high order solution accuracy starting from uh, a first order approximation. It's basically the construction of the solution, uh, making sure that the incorporation does not go across the, the, the uh, surface of this continuity and a lot of work in the ocean and there's Chen and, 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 uh, and Swiss groups. And then of course when, the, when it comes to fine element uh, uh, community, then this uh, the most uh, uh, then Mark work it would be the SUPG and by Brooks and Hughes and Castle and so on and so forth. And 
one can show that there are actually relationships between certain forms of SCG and artificial resources. So all these are you know, pretty standard has been widely used in the practice. Well, but the type of problems that we're interested in uh, are these type of problems where we see. These type of problems where um, you know, uh, fragmentation in the materials will have to be considered. So, okay. Right, so what you see on the left hand side is the hyper velocity penetration, uh, where the velocity is extremely high, the channel is shown sharp. And that is with the material failure. In fact, the failure mechanisms are very closely related to how the shafts are catch, especially the forms of so-called spalling effects. And uh, so the ability to, to model shaft properly in, in conjunction with the proper model of material defects is very important to these problems. Uh, this is also related to the research activities the recently formed Center for Extreme Events Research at UCSD. Okay, so these are the type of problems that we have to deal with. Right? So, uh, really, it's not the traditional food mechanics type of you know, problems where you can use malaria breeds and you try to use those algorithms that I mentioned in text and shock. Here, our main interest is salt. And, and the salt is going to fragment like this. Well, so then a natural choice of, of, of the simulation method will be, will be measured uh, due to the fact that it has some uh, nice underlying uh, uh, properties. Well, one can construct the approximation and the discretization by certain points. The points are not necessarily uniform, it can be fairly random depending on the physics of the problem. Uh, these methods typically uh, can be used to, to model, for example, uh, discontinuities by changing the, the discontinuity of tonal functions. There are some other nice properties, for example, adaptive refinement. It's very easy to do with H adaptivity. Uh, one does, it, does not have to deal with uh, conforming requirements when you do refinement at local. Uh, you can model a very large information problem with this type of approach and the, the results are in fact quite robust. Well, nevertheless, most of the measurement methods, and I can choose a few that I just listed here, uh, ended up having an approximation functions and operational functions. Okay? And therefore, the integration is an issue. Uh, because uh, Gauss project choice that we typically use in the final elements uh, does not give you sufficient accuracy. In fact, uh, because the supports, as you can see, for all these uh, approximation functions are overlap. And therefore, if you use Gauss projection, the projections are not consistent with the supports, you can get very large, uh, very large integration. That leads to uh, um, the loss of Galerkin orthogonality. Also, also as you know, if you do Galerkin equation, you have Galerkin orthogonality. However, the quadrature rule, the quadrature error, could uh, lead to the loss of the of the quality if the projection error is higher than the approximation error. Uh, and, and, uh, and then what you get is uh, uh, some optimal gradient conversions. Right? Uh, so one way to do that is to try to recover the molecular of the quality even at the, at the projection level. And uh, what work we done earlier is to introduce so-called civilized conforming normal integration. And what it does is it, it does not recover the living of the at the discrete level for all all of polynomial, but it recovers up to the first one. Uh, then, of course, in this kind of approach, one will have to uh, one will have to define so-called normal representative domain uh, for the smoothing of the gradient. And uh, this, unfortunately, cannot be done for uh, for this type of problem fragmentation problem because one will have to construct all this vulnerable cell uh, at every time step and that's just you know computationally just too expensive. Right? So the other way of course is to try to simplify this and hopefully uh, you know we can uh, 
get, a, get away from this conforming, smoothing domain. And why not hopefully be able to do something like as simple as a spherical domain for, for the smoothing. Now the smoothing gives you two things. One is to, to eliminate the zero energy mode, something similar to our last night. But the other purpose for the case of SCNR is to recover the record of abnormality at the, at the portion shift. Well, when you do that, when you do something like not come from the top of the smoothing, then you lose that, this nice uh, divergence problem. It has been shown in the first paper here that uh, to get get looking of abnormality to the first order, this condition is necessary for the portraiture. Unfortunately, when you have when you do have this conforming uh, smoothing cell, then this property is lost, and then you get back to the poor solution accuracy, even with the smoothing of the of the gradient. So we have to do something about it. Um, okay, so the the objectives of this work is to bring in what has been commonly used in fluid mechanics but try to apply that uh, in the form of, of a mesh field method and we introduce this smooth flex divergence operator where that's where we introduce the Riemann solution in the numerical calculation of the gradient and we'll show how we can uh, uh, introduce this kind of operator under the formulation of SCNI and uh, what we call a variationally consistent stabilized non-conforming normal inversion, which I will introduce in a few minutes. And the second objective is to control the oscillation, basically is to minimize the Gibbs phenomenon. And for this, we introduce the uh, uh, automatic shock detection algorithm under mesh free framework, and, uh, and then bring in the standard uh, velocity correction uh, so that uh, Loss is connected with the proper uh, shock physics, and then finally, which is the activity to ensure the solution accuracy near the shock time, because that's usually you have to do the first order approximation and the way from the shock, where you want to bring in a higher order basis with extrinsic enrichment, as an example. Okay, so just very briefly, uh, the basic equations as right? so you have this continuity, so you have uh, four additional unknowns because you have upstream and downstream values are different and you need three more equations, or well, the jump conditions give you three equations and you need one more, and that one more has to come from the Hugonian uh, thermodynamics, and typically it's measured experimentally. Uh, you, can, you can measure the Hugonian between the pressure and the density, and once you have that, then you can use the three jump conditions and transform that to different type of Hugonian. So this is, this is uh, sort of similar equations I have to deal with. Okay, so to, to explain the idea of how to bring in uh, a standard shock algorithms under the under the mesh field framework, I'm going to start with a simple scalar conservation equation. Okay, so here you have a conservation equation, F is the flux, and you can express that now in terms of the Lincoln equation. And as I said, I you know I'm more interested in using normal equations due to the type of problems that we're dealing with. So I, I simply discretize this equation by, by normal equation, but notice that now I have this, I have this uh, flux, the grid that that flux divergence scheme being modified. Okay. And this is modified based on uh, SCNR, where I will just take the boundary integral of the flux along the, the bottom of the cell associated with each point. And because as you know you have if the normal representative domains are, are conforming, then you have this condition, and obviously the flux is conserved. And then at each uh, boundary segment, uh, when I have to calculate the flux, I will use the characteristics to give me the Riemann solution, and I'll bring in the Riemann solution into the flux, and I'll calculate the flux and the boundary of each uh, one cell. Okay, so that's, that's pretty straightforward. And, uh, and then once you have uh, the flux corrected, then you use that to correct the velocity, and again you take that equation, you integrate in space and time, you discretize in space first, and this is where I have this SCNI and with this Riemann solution uh, embedded in there, and this is called gamma i, and then you then use gamma i in conjunction with the cell average because you need 
a law of approximation in the sharp plan to avoid the Gibbs phenomenon. So you simply do a cell averaging of U and within the time um, equation, and you use this uh, embedded uh, Riemann solution in the, in the flux divergence as a correction for the velocity field. And you can tell, you can even in the code, that you can have a switch and turn, turn this algorithm off and on depending on where, where the evaluation is in, in the space. Okay, so this procedure is pretty straightforward. Uh, let's look at the, an example problem. It's a standard Burgess equation where the flux is a concentric function of u. And of course now the wave speed is a function of u and therefore the, the wave on the, on the trailing side is going to catch up with the wave on the front side in terms of this So initially the waveform is, is something smooth and as it propagates then the, it will catch up and forms a sharp run. And this is the case without correction and this is the case with the correction that we have introduced. So, so far, so good, everything looks fine. Now, we, we then extend this to, to the linear solids. The only thing that, that will be different is now we have this vector equation, and I'll separate the, the stress uh, tensor into deviatoric and the volume action part. I'll do the deviatoric uh, stress, uh, the treatment of deviatoric stress, the standard way, simply in the integration line parts, and then we have the boundary term. But the, the more measured part, we, we keep it uh, without trans without bump, without um, you know without the divergence transformation. We keep it the, the divergence of, of the more measured stress. So by doing that, the purpose is to now I will again introduce this uh, divergence uh, uh, smoothing, where now the more measured stress, which is basically the pressure, is now calculated on the cell bound. Okay. Now, on the cell boundary, I uh, have to obtain pressure and I have also have to obtain, obtain the velocity field. So on each of the cell boundary, I will have the cell on the left hand side, I have the cell on the right hand side, I have the pressure, I have the velocity on each side. And this is now where you bring in this uh, uh, jump condition and you have this jump condition and also the thermal dynamics equation. So you have two equations, two unknowns. You can use the values on the left and the right of the cell, and you can obtain the pressure field and the velocity field on the cell bound. Right? So, so that means now I have the sharp field is embedded, and then once the, 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 the pressure field is not on the cell boundary, then you can use the boundary integral to obtain the, the divergence of the parametric stress. Okay, now finally, because I, I would like to have everything still carry out by, carry out by the, the normal point. So from the boundary point, how do I then uh, use those information to update the pressure at the normal point? Again, I start with the, I use the velocity that I have just obtained on the cell boundary, and I use that, the boundary information, to compute the strength rate, and then the universe strength rate to get the strength, and bring the strength into this uh, pressure volume to go in, and from there, Pressure. So everything uh, in fact is straightforward. Well, the last thing I have to talk about is, is the sharp uh, capturing. And uh, here we are using the idea from we can do on um, this uh, wave decomposition. Basically, the idea is very simple, very similar to recovery type of error estimation, and you basically reinterpret the solution. But using the, the, the interesting property of, for example, reproducing kernel that we produce, you can control the order of basis and the support size uh, to, to recover uh, polynomial up to arbitrary degree of P. So you can control the P and also the support size of, of, the, of the kernel function and do the reinterpolation of the numerical uh, result. And you can measure that if I have a numerical solution for the shaft on this very high order, and you can measure the low order portion after you do the convolution with this kind of reducing kernel. The low order portion is, is going to be exactly the same, but what has been changed is the high order portion, and therefore now you can get the difference between the original numerical solution and the interpolated solution. You, you can use that to capture the shaft. The shaft. So uh, that's also uh, done. Then, how do I do adaptive refinement? And uh, that's it. again, as I mentioned earlier, this is easy uh, for measurement. Suppose that I have, layer, I have a set of points, and 
right here at least at the new point, all you have to do is just, just to check how many kernels of force that cover this newly inserted point and just reconstruct the, the approximation functions by enforcing the polynomial uh, reproducing conditions. And you can do that locally, you don't really have to do it in a global sense, depending on where you insert the points. Okay, so um, then in this you can do a gap refinement in the sharp one, and, and, and away from the sharp one can increase, for example, the order basis, and you can do that with an extreme type of enrichment and uh, for the interest of time. I will talk about that. Okay, so here are a few test problems. Uh, this is a case where you introduce a discontinuity in the pressure field and the comparison of the case without correction and the correction and the legal solution. You see the difference. Uh, the prior point problem that uh, uh, it's a test on uh, shock waves, the elastic and plastic shock waves. And here are also the comparison on the left is without correction and on the right is the correction and compared with experimental data and they are really reasonably well. Uh, another test is to uh, to, to test in the case where you, have, you may have this uh, the sharp one which is oblique to the normal arrangement and uh, the similar approach has been applied to this and as you can see uh, the pressure field is quite stable and there's no oscillations at all. Okay, so now let's get down to uh, what we really want to uh, resolve which is the case that I want to model this type of problem and now not be able to use this kind of uh, conforming cell for, uh, for flux divergence calculation. But I hope that I can deal with this kind of uh, flux divergence calculation that, unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this does not uh, satisfy what we so called integration constraint, and we lose conversions like this. Right? Now, let's go back to a very simple problem. I have a very simple Poisson equation. And uh, I introduce linear basis in the in the reproducing kernel approximation. It's, uh, therefore, I expect that the output norm should have a, a time, should have a convergence frame of two. But what you see here, I have tested the four different methods: low order Gauss projection, direct normal integration, simply integrate at the point, and stabilize non-conforming normal integration, and stabilize conforming normal integration. And all of these four, only a C and I gives you the right convergence rate, and the other two you see, you have very poor rate of convergence. Uh, in fact, S N and I, uh, although it gives you uh, zero energy, you know, so sort of suppressed zero energy mode, but in terms of L2 norm, the error is actually even worse than the right normal equation due to the fact that uh, the gradient is calculated away from the normal point. Okay, so we have to do something about this. And this comes to the recent work on this operational consistency uh, for enthalpy directed exactness. To explain the idea, we start with a strong form and uh, some boundary conditions, and then the directed equation. Uh, so these are standard. Now, I would like to design a problem. I design a problem where the boundary variable problem solution is the enthalpy problem. Okay, and you can design that very easily. You choose this, and then you plug this one into the strong form and the boundary condition. You can get the source term. You can get the boundary term. So you can design this boundary variable, this kind of source term and boundary condition, so that the solution is exactly this, the one that you choose. So you choose that. Then uh, I also assume that my trial function, what's important is the trial function has the end of the complete condition. So, so I assume all these are ready, and I just plug all this into, into this Gerlachian equation. Okay? Now I will integrate this Gerlachian equation by quadrature. So here, the ones in brackets are the quadrature version of the inner problem. So what it says here is this. For you to get end for exactness in the Gerlachian solution, uh, the quadrature rule have to satisfy this condition. But unfortunately, with this equation, you see there's a lot of things involved. It involves the type of PDE that you have, involves the type of boundary condition you have, it involves the order of exactness that you try to achieve, and it also involves the test function. Okay, so this is a test function, that's right. This is a test function. So, 
Of course, if you have given PDE and given test option, then you can use this to design your portraiture such that this will be satisfied, right? So, for example, when n is 1, this gives you what you call a standard one element, so for linear patch test, and n is 2 is for genetic patch test. But it's hard to design this kind of portraiture tool, knowing that our approximation functions are typically rational functions. Okay? So they are not polynomial. So it's, it's not easy to design this portraiture tool. So what we have done instead is to play around with the test option. Because if you look at this equation, if I choose proper, proper, quote unquote, proper portraiture tool, it doesn't have to be perfect, but suppose it's good enough, that, that doesn't have zero images, things like that. Then I can then uh, design my test function so that this condition is satisfied. So that's, that's the approach. So here I have the, the tested trial functions. The trial functions is the one that has uh, n total completeness. And, I, uh, and then I collect the test function. And I collect the test function by enrichment of my trial function. I add a few more terms here, depending on how many this uh, integration constraints I have in order to achieve the gain of kidney uh, So this time, uh, I, I have to choose some basis, and then the coefficients to be obtained. Of course, you have to make sure that this enriched base, enrichment basis will have to be linearly independent with the base, with the, uh, with the trial, with the, with the trial functions. And what you do is, then you bring this one into this integration equation uh, that I just mentioned, and you can manipulate the equation and put everything on the right hand side. And if you look at the right hand side, that's the residual, right? So that's the residual of meeting this integration constraint. So if you have a, a portraiture rule, if you come up with a smart portraiture rule that satisfies the integration constraint, then you have zero residual and there's nothing to correct. But if you have a portraiture rule that uh, violates this integration constraint, then I have this correction and I will solve a linear, the local linear system. For, for the, those coefficients. Well, of course, now you worry about additional set of linear systems to solve. And so let me give you, uh, you but you can actually play around with it. So let me give you a simple example. Here I restrict myself and just wanted to get uh, the linear patch test. Okay, so first of all, okay, the can examples. And uh, I put that into this equation. And so now you look at the right hand side, it's nothing but that convergence uh, condition, which is why SCNR sort of works because it meets this, like the, the, the gradient on the, on, the, on the test function meets this condition. And therefore, for SC and I, I have nothing to correct because in this condition is exactly satisfied. But for other portrait tools, I will use that to correct. And in fact, the trick you can play is to do the enrichment on the gradient, not on, not on, on, not on the, the, the test function itself. And uh, you just have to make sure that these are linearly independent. So a simple function group we have tested is so simply a piecewise constant function. And in that case, you can actually solve these coefficients uh, analytically, and you don't, no need to resolve the system. Okay, so it's just a simple test problem. Uh, I have a problem I design it so that the solution is exactly linear. And now I tested the few Gauss uh, project the right now the only question S, N, and I, and they, they don't give the exact solution to S, N, of course, but with the corrective one, then everything is exact. And look at the normal rate, and look at the values. The ones in, in blacks are the ones without, without correction. Here, I arrange the normal spacing. When lambda is zero, it's uniform distribution. And then I start to perturb, perturb the normal distributions, and uh, now, in this way, no, the normal distribution becomes more and more uh, random. You see the, the ones in red, you see when the nodes are uniform distributed, in fact, all integration methods work. They all work well. But as you start to move nodes around, you see now they start to generate a very large error, especially if you have normal integration, and especially SNI is very good. SCNI, of course, we know it's going to satisfy, but even pulse portraiture, up to 5 by 5 pulse portraiture, you still have significant amount of error. Well, then if you do the correction, even direct model in equation S and N I, and even one point Gauss position, you get you get the well that's of course it doesn't expect, right? Because it's designed that way. And uh, uh, now we use this to solve a problem with a higher order solution, and the ones in dash lines are the ones without corrections, 
and the one with conventional side is solid line, and now I see that we cover uh, optimum related conversions. Okay, and you can use this to test some vector problems. This is something I'm going to just go fast with that. Um, and again, as I said, you can actually get you know, higher order uh, cash caps. For example, it's a little cash test and a lot of point distributions. And the red no no, without correction, correction, you see all these values. Uh, without correction, you see all of them at large area. This is the case with quadratic bases. And with correction, you get the exact solution for, for the red number and for any order of Gauss quotient. Okay, um, so now with this, I now come back to uh, the sharp problem. Okay, so space integration has now switched to this kind of, uh, of, uh, of a connect integration rule, meaning now I'm going to do a smoothing of the, of the diversions of the, uh, you know, the uh, Plus divergence on on the non-component domain. Okay. So now, what do I do with this? Uh, what we have tested this idea is now uh, for a given point, and we're supposed to take the gradient of the I mean the divergence of, of the of the flux. I will define its first define its neighbor, and then uh, for each pair of this point with its neighbor, uh, you connect the dot. And you have a pressure value and velocity value at each of the points. Okay, so I will now calculate the, the values at the midpoint. And at the midpoint, this is where I will now bring in the, the jump conditions. Okay, I will bring in those uh, the jump conditions and then I, I have a Riemann solution. So I have a Riemann solution solved at midpoint of each of these uh, line connection. And then I will simply do a Interpolation of this calculated pressure and velocity flow from the midpoint to the to the cell to the cell line. Okay, and then from there I will calculate the gradient of pressure and the gradient of the velocity. Okay, so now let's test how this works. Uh, here, so here now it's all calculated by SNNI and conforming cell is being used. And this is the same test problem that we have tested earlier. And uh, as you can see now, this is a problem. You have a discontinuity on the pressure and velocity field. And uh, you see this uh, the wave speed has been very accurately captured. Uh, we do lose a little bit of the accuracy. The, the, the sharp point like, uh, has been run a little bit, a little bit. But other than that, uh, the solution accuracy is, is, is very high. Uh, the test of the fire plate problem. Again, this is the use the pressure field and uh, this is the calculation use SNI and you see the, the pressure field is very stable. Now then application to fragment impact problem. I need a material model. Right? Well uh, this is a type of a problem where microcraps will first introduce in the in microstructures and then they will join together and form some damage, uh, large cell damage and the structure damage. So this constricted model for damage law is not easy to construct. Of course, there are many available uh, constricted model for, for damage for mechanics, but all of them are, are phenomenologically based. So what we are trying to do is I'm, going, I'm trying to do a homogeneous, I'm trying to do a multi-scale calculation where I first take uh, the, the microstructure of for example of concrete. And now I will apply some kind of modes. You know, it's just like what you do experiment by like tension and shear, and then you grow the crack. I will do again on the mesh simulation and skip all the details because this is uh, a well you know, established area, a mesh simulation of crack provocation, and I will do that simulation at the microscopic level. And at each of the time step you can calculate calculate the free energy, the Helmholtz free energy. Okay? Now I'm using uh, the approach that uh, we, can, we can prove that the, the Helmholtz free energy of the crack microstructure is equivalent to the Helmholtz free energy of this homogenized damaged concrete. And, and once you do this equivalence, 
Then, uh, meaning that if I do the uh, microscopic calculation, I can get the equivalent help of free energy for this uh, damage model, for this damage continuum. So if you have that, then you simply take the derivative of this uh, Helmholtz free energy with respect to this the, uh, correct uh, relief rate. And you can do that by, by taking fine difference. Right? So, so from all these calculations, I'll extract these damage tensors. This could be scalar damage, uh, scalar damage, damage model, or, or fully consolidated damage model. So the damage laws are calculated by computation, by a small square computation. So now this is now applied to some uh, penetration problems, and I have uh, some validations that uh, it's a fully penetration fully, uh, through uh, fully um, concrete plates with different thickness, and I have experimental uh, value to compare. And the dash line is the exit velocity, and the solid line is the velocity history of three sets of uh, experiments and calculation, and the uh, movement is, is uh, quite reasonable. Also have a comparison of the Final example is a crater formation and an experimental data. Okay, and now uh, this is a work in progress. Now we apply this to uh, a more complicated uh, penetration and fragmentation problems, and we are now making comparison of this, you know, uh, damage not in the holes and also the, the damage, the bullet shape of the experimental uh, observation. So in conclusion, uh, we have introduced a mesh-free based uh, shock model the formulation where we bring in some of the standard uh, uh, you know, shock algorithms in, in, uh, in fluid dynamics into the mesh-free calculation but apply that to nonlinear solids and we have formulated that under a formulation of SCNI and a variationally consistent SNNI. Uh, we have also introduced an activity for, for sharp bound capturing and for local refinement. And the advantage of you know, this method is that the, the essential physics is, is enforced and all the oscillations are under control and higher order solution accuracy for the sharp and intended. And this formulation is currently under extension to modeling of uh, plastic effects. So this I think.